Good morning, everybody. This is Dr. Baker, and I am here with Abigail and Riley in our classroom. Riley. Can you guys hear me over the mic? How about on Zoom? Can you guys hear me? I can hear you, yes. All right, perfect. All right, let me pull up the slide and we'll get started here in a minute. Let me do it. Okay. All right, can everybody see my uh, PowerPoint right now? good okay all right hello everybody um as you guys know i'm your graduate assistant riley sullivan and today i'm going to be giving you guys a special lecture over a topic of interest that i have that i'm going to be using for my thesis and i, I believe it's relevant for this period as well um so we're going to shift a little gears we've been talking about world war one and i wanted to shift to another war which was the civil war but we're not going to talk about the actual conflict but the memory of the civil war itself so why is this important for the time we're studying right now, you might be asking. Um, because really it shapes society really, or has a really big impact on society at this point, especially during the 1910s. Uh, we'll get a little bit more into it of how it's impacted society. But first, I wanted to start off with the image of, uh, this image comes from Gettysburg at the reunion in 1913. And as you can see, there's two groups of men uh, grasping hands over a stone wall and they're basically uh, trying to forget the war and trying to show the nation that they have reconciled and forgotten old, uh, old, old, um, I'm trying to think of the word, sorry. Uh, they're trying to forget about, basically forget the war is what I'm trying to say. So we saw this in a previous week, we saw with the Spanish-American War, we saw a similar image where we saw a union, a union and a Confederate officer shaking hands and they're, uh, collaboration to essentially take part in the Spanish-American War. So this is a feeling that Americans have largely come to recognize with the period, which is the sentiment of reconciliation. However, Civil War memory is a much more complicated topic than that. And so that's what I wanted to dive into today and kind of dispel some of these myths of where reconciliation was really the lasting memory of the war and really where the state of Civil War memory was by the time of World War I. So what is Civil War memory? Civil War memory is how Americans choose to remember the Civil War. That's a basic uh, definition of what Civil War memory is. Uh, Robert, historian Robert Penn Warren wrote that the Civil War is for the, imagination, or for the American imagination, the great single event of our history, and that is our only felt history. Now this is a statement that he wrote in the 1960s, and we can still see that sentiment today. We can still feel the uh, repercussions of the Civil War today, especially in the uh, Confederate monuments debates that we've seen in recent days. And it really shows how uh, long lasting the memory of the Civil War is and how impactful it is to our society today. Um, I also have noted under this is that when trying to understand Civil War memory, I found out that it's pretty important to try to understand the memory of Reconstruction as well, because Really, when you look at the two events, they really go together very nicely. And then arguments that they make in regards to the Civil War really stem out of the actions that occur during Reconstruction. Uh, what is the difference between history and memory? Now, this was something that I had a lot of trouble when I first started doing research on uh, memory studies. Because a lot of times you think of memory, oh, it would be history because I'm thinking of the past and remembering how a certain event went. However, it's not as simple as that. So memory is how a group or an individual chooses to remember a particular event. So for example, 
let's say you're in, you're remembering uh, in high school, um, you're an all A student, and you're remembering that particular event as a good time in your life. Now, odds are you're probably going to try to forget the events that occurred during your high school career that were bad. So if you cheated on a test or if you did drugs or something, you're going to try to ignore those events and try to promote like, oh, this was such a great time in my life. Now, history, on the other hand, is quite the contrary. It is evidence-supported arguments about the past that study how events have affected a group over a period of time. So essentially, the simplest way to kind of uh, digest that definition is that history is examining that group that we were talking about in memory, so in this case, the individual in his high school career, and examining everything that they had done in high school. So that would include the bad memories as well as the good memories. It also uh, digests um, counter memories. So somebody else remembering that individual as well. So this leads us into our topic. And there are four types of Civil War memory. Now the first one is the one that's gonna be the main focus for this uh, lecture, which is the white supremacist or the lost cause memory. I'll go more into detail of what it was, but it was largely a Southern memory of the war. Uh, they'd use it to try to um, reconstruct a pre-Civil War society, is what we'll see here in a minute. There's also the Unionist vision of the war. This was largely taken up by, uh, obviously, Northern individuals. They saw that the memory of the war was one of uh, creating this lasting reunion. There's also the Emancipationist memory of the war. This was large, this was a um, major memory amongst African Americans after the war, as they saw the lasting legacy of the Civil War being uh, the emancipation of slaves and the abolition of slavery. And then lastly, as we just discussed with the previous images, the reconciliationist memory of the war. Uh, this will become popular later on, both in Northern and Southern versions of the war. And they essentially wanna to try to forget all of the things that they had fought the Civil War over and really come back together as a nation. So Civil War memory really begins during the Civil War. A lot of historians have acknowledged this. Uh, historians often point to the Gettysburg Address as one of the first instances of uh, speaking memory during the war. However, I wanted to point to when the actual conflict ended, which was at uh, Appomattox Courthouse, where as we see, Robert E. Lee surrenders the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia to Ulysses S. Grant. And so really at this point, the two sides start to develop their own perspectives of how the war or how the post-war world was going to be shaped. Obviously, the Southerners are going to take this idea that, oh, everything's going to go back to normal. We're going to have the society that we had before the war, and we're just going to be reintegrated in the Union. Union veterans, their memory is divided in some areas. However, they take that they want to punish the South, and they want to essentially uh, bring back the Union and make sure that the lasting legacies of emancipation stay intact. Now, I want to point out here that this, the emancipationist memory was popular amongst some Union veterans. It wasn't popular amongst all because some of them believe that the uh, legacy of the war was to bring uh, reunion to the country. So not everybody's going to buy into this narrative. So as you can see, there's already conflicting views of how the post-war world is going to shape. And so that brings into our next discussion of the Southern memory of the war, the lost cause. So historian Edward L. Ayers wrote that after Appomattox, many Southerners saw Appomattox as the end, as resolution. Instead, reconstructed, reconstruction presented them with a much more revolutionary way of life than they expected. And so as we saw in Dr. Baker's lectures over the reconstruction, we see the passage of the 13th, the 14th, and the 15th Amendments that essentially start to bring about equality for African Americans. How there are Southerners who are um, used to the institution of slavery and had this white supremacist mindset did not like this too much. So what they did is they started instituting these laws that we saw with Jim Crow and the black codes that we saw as well. They also start to create a memory of the war that kind of hides what was actually accomplished in the war. So this has come to be known as the lost cause, which says on the slide is a white or Southern white supremacist memory of the war. Some of the arguments that it claims that were the legacies of the war was that slavery was not the cause of the war, but rather states' rights. This becomes a very popular argument. Uh, we still can see that to this day. There's a lot of uh, books that, be, that are being written today that still make this argument. 
So this is something that has continued over to today. Uh, there's also the argument that Southern soldiers fought honorably and nobly. Uh, this has become a popular argument as well because essentially they wanted to bring about uh, Southern solidarity um, because of the fact that not all Southerners were really on the same side of how they should fight the war. We've heard the notions of uh, it was a rich man's war and a poor man's fight. But after the war, they wanted to promote this cause and they wanted to unite all Southern soldiers. So if they fought for the Confederacy in any capacity, they wanted to label them as a fighting for an honorable and a noble cause. They also made arguments that overwhelming resources and manpower won the war. Uh, this one is a military, obviously it's a military strategy kind of argument for the lost cause. I won't dive too much into that. Uh, one of my specialties is military history, so I could go on all day about this, but we're gonna skip over that one. Um, but the last one I wanted to point out is it condemned emancipation and the abolition of slavery. So obviously this goes hand in hand with the first argument where they claim that slavery was not the cause of the war. So they wanted to kind of downplay that, okay, they weren't really, we don't agree with emancipation, we don't agree with the abolition of slavery, which is gonna fuel much of the rhetoric that goes into the post-war era. So where does the lost cause essentially begin? So Southern writers had been writing uh, notions of the lost cause even before the end of the war, but really the person that receives the most credit for naming the movement was an individual by the name of Edward A. Pollard. He wrote a Southern history of the war called the lost cause in 1867. And it essentially laid these claims and these arguments for future writers to develop. Um, and so I have an excerpt on the next slide from this uh, document that I would like to read to you guys to show you just kind of the racially fueled rhetoric that was involved with this movement. Let me move this real quick so I can read it all. All right, so we shall not enter upon the discussion of the moral question of slavery, but we may suggest a doubt here whether that obvious term slavery, which has been so long imposed by the exaggeration of Northern writers upon the judgment and sympathies of the world is properly applied to the system of servitude in the South which was really the mildest in the world, which did not rest on the acts of debasement and disenfranchisement, but elevated the African and was in the interest of human improvement, and which by the law of the land protected the Negro in life and limb and in many personal rights, and by the practice of the system bestowed upon him a sum of individual indulgences, which made him altogether the most striking type in the world of cheerfulness and content. So as you can see, there's a lot to digest from this uh, excerpt right here, and it's about a 700 page book, so you can tell there's gonna be a lot of information very similar to this. And so, as we can see, what he's trying to do is downplay the role of slavery in the war, but also to try to say that, hey, slavery wasn't altogether that bad. It was actually a better system than what we're seeing today, as this is the beginning, when he published this book, is at the beginning of uh, Congressional Reconstruction. So he's trying to make these arguments that really slavery wasn't that bad and we made a great mistake of ending that institution, which we'll see in uh, arguments that are made later on in the lost cause and even a film that I'm gonna be discussing later on in the lecture. So the rise of the lost cause during the 1870s and the 1880s is really when we start to see this movement start to gain a lot of steam, especially in the South. Um, it was usually, largely because they were fighting back against the uh, laws passed during Reconstruction. They were trying to make counter arguments that kind of justified why they had seceded and then why slavery was a good institution to them. One of the earliest writers, which he focused mainly on the military aspects of the war was Jubal Early. He focused on the notions that the Southern soldier had fought honorably and nobly and that secession was really because of states' rights, not because of slavery, because of an aggressive North. Um, and so he has some racist rhetoric. However, he focuses mainly on how the Confederacy was defeated militarily, which is in itself interesting because a lot of it's a bunch of garbage when you look at it. But uh, what he talks about a lot in his writings is um, basically Robert E. Lee was the, this demigod, this perfect general that had fought these great battles and that only because of overwhelming manpower and resources was he uh, overcome. He didn't discuss how the Confederacy was starting to topple from within uh, during the last year of the war. And he really tries to ignore a lot of the political aspects of the war. 
However, the most influential organization that would promote the lost cause, and especially racist rhetoric, would be an organization known as the United Daughters of the Confederacies. Um, one of the lasting legacies we see of them to today is uh, the monuments we've all seen. I have on the next slide uh, one of those monuments that they would have erected, as I mentioned before. Robert E. Lee was viewed as a demigod, and he essentially became the face of the lost cause. He was seen as this individual that could do no wrong, that had fought righteously, and had led his men in an honorably way. A lot of the uh, racist rhetoric that they were coming out with during this period. And they would come at these dedications for these monuments. They would also have, they'd be racially charged and saying how the racial order was disrupted because of the war and how they needed to return it back through the enactment of Jim Crow. And since they were trying to justify the, the system of oppression during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. They also have, I wanna point out, is textbooks. A lot of the imagery that we see from the Jim Crow South comes through the textbooks that they wrote within the South. Uh, many of these promote that African Americans have this certain image of that they're these savages, as we saw with the uh, Native Americans earlier this semester, and that they promoted them as almost uh, adult children where they couldn't control themselves. So they wanted to make sure that this racist rhetoric supported what they were practicing with the Jim Crow South. So as this movement begins to gain steam, it starts to become popular throughout not only the South, but even some Northerners start to accept this uh, memory of the war. So as it says here, Jim Crow is the lasting legacy of the victory the South won through the memory of the war. Because by doing this, they were able to essentially practice everything they were preaching through the lost cause. And the North fully was aware of what was going on with the Jim Crow South. However, they chose not to uh, intervene in any of those uh, laws and actions that they displayed throughout the South. By the turn of the century, the lost cause had become the most popular memory of the war in the South. It, like I said, it, it started to become a um, very popular uh, notion in the North. And when one would read the history, especially during the early 20th century of the Civil War, it was mostly from a Southern point of view. So clearly, they had lost the actual conflict, but they won the peace. Um, a reconciliationist memory in the North is what led to a lot of the acceptance of many of these myths and notions of the lost cause. And it really was able to achieve sectional reconciliation. Now, I do want to point out here, Union veterans did not really subscribe to this reconciliationist memory of the war as much of the Northern public. If you want to learn more information, our uh, Dr. Brian Jordan, he's written a great book called Marching Home that discusses much of the Union veterans and their memories of the war. So I definitely recommend reading that if you want to know more as far as what Union veterans thought of the war. So then as we turn into the 20th century and we kind of get to the period that we're discussing in class, we start to see the popularization of the lost cause through new mediums. Uh, the first work that I wanted to discuss, which actually leads into the second one, is Thomas Dixon Jr.'s The Klansman, the Historical Romance of the Ku Klux Klan, which was written in 1905. It later becomes a play, but then it has gained such popularity that by 1915, D.W. Griffith, with the assistance of Thomas Dixon, uh, writes the film The Birth of a Nation. And it's a, a film that showed a white supremacist memory of the war and of reconstruction by making the argument that African Americans were better off in slavery and that they were going to essentially be uh, disrupting the racial order if they kept them in this free society and gave them equality. And so what we see in the film, it has three major areas that it depicts. It has the post-war period, the antebellum period, which if you watch the film, it's almost this harmonious period. It looks like everybody's happy, uh, slaves, uh, their masters, everybody seems to be in this perfect harmony. And then the war comes and it disrupts this harmony that the Southerners are arguing through the lost cause. And then you see in the post-war period, almost this chaotic scene. Now, what the Southerners are arguing is that by granting them equality, there's this notion of the Negro rule that we'll see in a clip that's from the movie here in a second, in which they're going to enact all these laws that they thought were absolutely outrageous, like intermarriage and um, as far as equality in general which we'll see in, in a video here in a second. But their major argument was a romantic, 
romanticizing the Ku Klux Klan. So like the Southern soldiers, they argued that the Confederates took, essentially gave up their gray uniforms and put on these white robes to fight honorably for Southern rights and for uh, what the South believed in. And so they depict them in a heroic mission to essentially demonize and oppress African Americans during this period. However, they saw this as a great gesture because they were saving the nation and what their eyes believed. So here's a clip. Let's see if I can get this to work from the movie. Well, see if it'll may have to do something real quick. Which this clip comes from, it's a it comes from the film and it's of a legislative session that occurred what they say after the war. <laughs> Okay. Let's see, give us one second. We'll see if we can try to get everybody to view this. I think Abigail's going to get her iPad and try to point at the screen. And if you can't see the film, um, you can also, I'll post the, uh, the link to the clip later, and you can also look it up through that as well. It's only about two and a half minutes, so it's not a very long clip. Let me know when you're ready, Abigail. Might not be the best of quality. All right, let's hit play. Let me restart. As you can see from the film, as you can see from the film, from that short clip, you can see definitely how um, how 
a white supremacist memory of the war had succeed or had succeeded and was becoming popular, especially amongst the American public. The success of the film has actually been noted as the first uh, blockbuster hit for Hollywood, and was a huge box office success. It was um, viewed in the White House by President Woodrow Wilson, who had great praise for the film, and it demonstrates a sad, sad uh, state of society at this point in the acceptance of a white supremacist memory, not only of the war, but of Reconstruction by romanticizing um, a white supremacist vision and also the Ku Klux Klan as well. You would see later in the film, if you look it up as well, it's a, over a three hour film, but at the end of the film, you'll start to see the Ku Klux Klan going after what they had was a, uh, a black face, which is where a white man would paint his face black individual who is trying to represent an African American who is essentially trying to rape and commit acts of violence against white women in the film. So it definitely displays a sad uh, state of not only race relations, but of the state of Civil War memory at this point in time. So now we're going to return to the initial image that we discussed, and we're going to discuss what was going on in this period of the First World War, well, just prior to the First World War, and it was a significant event for Civil War memory. This is the 50th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg and also the 50th anniversary of the war. So you see vast amounts of literature coming out during this period that are trying to remember the war, especially a Southern memory of the war. Um, you see, one of the aspects they were interested in was kind of uh, downplaying the white supremacist role of the war and then upplaying a reconciliationist memory of the war. And so they wanted to look to the veterans of the conflict and show that they had forgotten the battles and they had forgotten what they had fought over and rather they were embracing each other as brothers in arms. President Woodrow Wilson, who was a leading lost cause writer in the early 20th century, spoke at this event and he said, but 50 years have gone by since then and I crave the privilege of speaking to you for a few minutes of what those 50 years have meant, what have they meant? They have meant peace and union and vigor and the maturity and might of a great nation. How wholesome and healing the peace has been. We have found one another again as brothers and comrades in arms, enemies no longer, generous friends rather, our battles long past, the quarrel forgotten, except that we shall not forget the splendid valor, the manly devotion of the men who then arrayed against one another, now grasping hands and smiling into each other's eyes. So as you can see, he's trying to promote a reconciliationist memory of the war, and he's also applying a lost cause memory of the war without directly addressing uh, what they would have called a racial question back then. He was saying, what have those 50 years since the end of the Civil War meant? He says they have meant peace and union. Well, what does this mean, peace and union? They essentially forgot what the meaning of the war was, which was emancipation, and they believed that they were uh, achieving progress through reconciliation rather than uh, achieving progress where they could have by applying civil rights and achieving equality. So he ignores the oppression of African Americans and he promotes this image of reconciliation, not only amongst the veterans, but amongst the Southern and the Northern peoples as a whole. So this focus on veterans is actually a topic for, or the topic for my thesis. And I wanted to share with you guys uh, some of what's in my thesis and one of the major projects, that, or the major project, I should say, that I'm discussing in my thesis. So there's a set of questionnaires which is unique to Tennessee. I haven't seen any from another state, and if anybody knows any others, uh, please let me know. But it's called the Tennessee Civil War Veterans Questionnaires. So during this period, in 1915 to be exact, individuals were looking back to what they would have considered at the time their greatest generation. The, the Civil War period, the veterans from that period. And they wanted to make their arguments of what are, however they were trying to remember the war through their memories. Now, obviously in the South, they're gonna be pointing to the lost cause. Uh, the two individuals that wrote this set of documents was Gustavus W. Dyer and John Throtwood Moore. They both believed they wanted to create a, what they called a true history of the Old South because they believed Northern writers and Northern memories of the war were trying to destroy a Southern memory of the war. Obviously, if we've seen by this time, that's not the case. The Southern memory of the war has become one of the most popular memories of the war at this point. 
but nonetheless, they wanted to make this argument and continue to solidify their memory of the war while trying to destroy especially visions of reunion and emancipation that were still persistent in the North. So I have a few responses from this that kind of supports the arguments that were being made of the lost cause from the uh, Tennessee veterans, specifically the Confederate Tennessee veterans. So the first one with uh, some crude writing says, by far a better feeling than between the colored race and the right race than there is today. So E.F. Alexander, who wrote this response, was basically saying that life was better before the Civil War. He's taking up the argument that we saw in the birth of a nation, where they say that there was this harmonious period that was disrupted by this great event that really disrupted the racial social order. Robert Austin would somewhat, con um, would somewhat, con somewhat agree with this stance and say slaveholders mingled with those that did not have slaves, they were sociable with each other and seemed to enjoy life better than they do now. So clearly they believed that slavery was the right institution and they believed that it was a better um, period of time for the South. And actually Gustavus W. Dyer, who wrote these questionnaires, wrote in his book titled Democracy in the, Old so or in the South Before the Civil War, wrote that the most perfect form of democracy was in the pre-Civil War South, so in the antebellum South where there was slavery present. You believe everybody commingled and they had an equal say in government. Obviously, we know this is not the case as African Americans were not uh, represented within government during this period. So it shows you how they wanted to look back to the veterans to confirm their arguments and what they would have believed. And remember both the Civil War and Reconstruction in a peculiar light that promoted white supremacy and rather than to uh, remember the true meaning of the war, which would have been emancipation and the equality for all, which unfortunately would not be achieved to the 1960s with the Civil Rights Act. And in some ways, we still haven't achieved fully the vision of the Civil War to this day. So the last slide, I just have some sources that I've used during this lecture, and then also some further readings that you guys might be interested if you wanted to know a little bit more about uh, Civil War memory. Some that I'd like to highlight would be David Blight's Race and Reunion. This is probably my favorite book on the Civil War now. I got a lot introduced to it by Dr. Jordan, and it's a really fantastic book. Another book that's also great with uh, uh, Civil War memory is uh, Caroline E. Janney's uh, Remembering the Civil War. It's also another one, and it shows kind of the limitations to the argument of reconciliation, much of what I discussed in this. I'd also like to point out Brian Matthew Jordans, who's our professor here at uh, Sam Houston State, and he wrote a book called Marching Home, which I had mentioned earlier. It's also a great read on uh, Union veterans. So that concludes my lecture. I hope you all enjoyed it. I certainly enjoyed putting it together. And if you guys have any questions, uh, feel free to try to ask, answer them. Mm, just out of curiosity, um, how much do you think most of these people were just lying and just like disillusioned with, you know, thinking this was a, like a, a Southern, you know, sad cause, you know, like, oh, poor us, that states rights, poor us, something like that, yeah. in order to kind of promote this idea that the South had fought this honorable, fought for this honorable and noble cause. So they had to fabricate quite a bit of information in order to do this. Um, one of the most significant was this, with the slavery uh, versus states rights argument. If you look, there's a book I did not include. It discusses uh, Southern secession treatment. Uh, Can you hear me?
me now? Yes, yeah. I can hear you. Where did I cut off at? Sorry about that. You were mentioning about a book that you didn't include in uh, one of these slides. Okay, yes. Um, so one of the books that I didn't include is about Southern secessionist uh, commissioners that went to the various secession commissions during the secession crisis of 1860 to 1861. And their rhetoric was filled with a lot of, uh, uh, slavery was the cornerstone of the Confederacy. Uh, this would be a major argument for Alexander Stevens and his cornerstone of the Confederacy speech. Um, but after the war, they tried to say, uh, that's not really what we said. That's uh, journalists misinterpreting what we said. And so you see a lot of fabrication, especially on that part. And there's a lot of documentation that backs up that they did fabricate that information. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. They were just um, basically trying to get more uh, empathy for the cause and hope to spark it again to talk more about more talks about slavery and the and like the glorious benefits of it again, I guess, in a way they were trying to keep it alive. That's what I see it. Yeah, exactly. Thank you, Philip. Is there any other questions? Dr. Baker. <laughs> I would love to hear a little bit more about the military aspect of things. Okay. Yes. So I'm curious how they were trying to spin that. And, and if you could just tell us a little more about that, that's interesting. OK, so let's see. Maybe repeat the question on your mic. OK, so Dr. Baker wanted me to go basically more depth about the uh, claim of the lost cause, where they discussed how overwhelming resources and manpower had um, essentially affected the outcome of the Civil War. And why did they make this argument? So this one is, hopefully I don't go into too much detail because I can go all day about this one. But uh, the simplest example is we've probably heard of General Ulysses S. Grant being called a butcher. And um, by doing this, the Southerners made the argument that Northerners really threw overwhelming resources at their lines with frontal assaults until it exhausted all the ammunition of the Confederates and they had to be forced to retreat. And then they eventually had to be forced to uh, uh, surrender eventually. They, and this argument takes away from the side that the Confederate government had started to collapse internally. They wanted to make it sound like we were perfect up until Grant started throwing everything at us. And so they make this argument throughout the whole war, but if you look at the military campaigns, especially of Grant, um, he's a far, far superior general than Robert E. Lee. You can look at the Vicksburg campaign. You can look at the Overland campaign, which is essentially a um, recreation of the Vicksburg campaign. And so they developed this argument to try to say, OK, we didn't really have all this um, desertion amongst our troops. It kind of backs up with the argument of uh, Southern soldiers that fought um, honorably and nobly. And so uh, I guess up in some, they just really developed this to kind of explain why they lost instead of saying, it's probably our generalship that made us lose the war. A question, if I may. Did this um, also try to gloss over the problems that the Confederate States of America had in organizing as a group? Did yes. Jefferson Davis have a lot of trouble getting the individual states mm -hmm. to do some sort of coordinated planning yes. or finance? Well, there was a lot of kind of there's a lot of division within the South. Um, we see the first instance is you see a lot of Southerners go over and take an oath of allegiance to uh, the North. And the other aspect we see, which I mentioned before, was desertions. As far as him getting states, I believe it was the Georgia governor. They could not cooperate together, and they were on opposite sides. And he actually feared when Sherman was going through Georgia that the Georgia governor would uh, easily just give up the state to. Um, to the Union. Um, so there's a lot of kind of tension within the Confederate government. It was really, we talk about a two party system in the United States, it's really a one party system in that. It was really a totalitarian uh, administration there. And he really, because when you look at his war record, he was essentially ruling almost like a king, regardless of what the Confederate Congress said. He instituted the first uh, 
American War Draft. A lot of people give that credit to Abraham Lincoln, but it was actually the Confederacy. He um, also, before uh, Lincoln took away the rights of habeas corpus, he also did it right before Lincoln as well. So it was really, there's a lot of division within the Southern government to begin with. And so it starts to collapse in the last year of the war. And that's where this argument of the overwhelming manpower tries to gloss over that and say, okay, well, we really lost because on the military front rather than the political front. Are there any other questions online? Any questions in class? No question. All right, good question. So Abigail just asked, um, how does Civil War memory play into how uh, the Civil War is taught in high school? Um, now, I can't go from personal experience just because I can't remember U.S. history from because I was in eighth grade when we discussed the Civil War. But um, from, what, from what I've read from articles is it's – we'll go back to the United Daughters of the Confederacy, which I discussed earlier. They wrote a lot of the textbooks. And so they start to put in the racist rhetoric, these claims that the lost cause was making, and they start to teach them, and it's had a great impact. And really, when you look at uh, Civil War memory, even to today, amongst the popular sphere, it still has this large uh, following of the lost cause. It may have dropped some of the white supremacist visions of the war, but it would still practice, it was over slavery, not states' rights, and then over... Um, uh, the overwhelming manpower would have been one of the arguments, and it would have discussed how Southern soldiers fought honorably and nobly. I also want to point out, with the reconciliationist tone, they would have started addressing uh, Union veterans as fighting honorably and nobly as well. So it would have had a great impact, even to today, of how Civil War is taught within uh, the classroom in high school. Any other questions? Last chance. All right. I think I'm going to end my lecture there. Uh, I didn't know if Dr. Baker wanted to say anything before we went. I just want to thank Riley for an excellent lecture. I think we all enjoyed that and we all learned something. And so please, if you have feedback or if you have questions that you think of later, that you'd like to ask Riley or feedback on how he did, because remember, this is part of his experience as a master's degree student. He's giving this lecture as, as part of his learning. So if you guys wanna give him any kind of comments, please be constructive, but I'd be happy to receive those comments. I can take your name off of them and forward them on to Riley, or you could simply contact Riley directly if you're not worried about having your name on something. But um, I think Riley would love it if you sent comments or feedback. Especially and Riley says, especially questions. He'd love to get questions. This is what he loves, and he's been working hard on it. And your questions also may help him as he works on his master's thesis and his research. So let's thank Riley. And everybody, thank you for being here, whether on Zoom or in person. And uh, next week, we will have class on Zoom. But let's just give Riley a, a big thank you. I'm going to give him some applause. And people who are present physically, you are um, welcome to leave when you're ready. Thanks. People on Zoom, thanks for being here.